Okay, I'm not sure if we have many guests here today with these masks on, but my name is Christina Katzman, and on behalf of the Women's Ministry Fellowship, we welcome you here today. Um, things may look a little different than our typical Pineland Family Fellowship, but uh, we are praising the Lord that we can even be here today. And we are um, grateful also that we'll be gathering tomorrow as well for worship. So um, some announcements as well. Uh, we are gathering for worship tomorrow. So if you haven't already, please register online at the Pineland uh, Baptist Church website. And uh, we'll be following our usual social distancing and COVID protocols. Um, we'll be exiting out the front and uh, unless you need to use the elevators. And it'll be one at a time. Um, in the facilities as well. So as you entered this afternoon, hopefully you got one of our service cards. Um, on one side of it, there is a short bio of our speaker today and the scripture passage. And on the other is the order of service for our day. And on the top right-hand corner, um, you should see a little number on your card and you will need that number for later. So uh, hang on to this because you'll need it. Um, the title or theme of our service today is Trusting God Through the Seasons of Life. And so I'd like to read a passage of scripture from God's word, and it says this. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. And that is from Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 8. And so today we'll hear Ainsley Hogg share her testimony in person with us, and we welcome their family and their season of change and new ministry in Canada. And we rejoice in a season of new life with the Houston family and baby Elizabeth, or not so baby Elizabeth anymore, and the Buscarino and Blundell family with baby Grayson. And Marie will be sharing a word from Mark 4 about his presence in the storm. And so whatever season of life you find yourself in, I hope, and our hope for you today, is that you would be encouraged to trust God, trust in the Lord to see you through whichever season you're facing right now. And so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to honor you and glorify you with our worship today. We pray that through our voices in song, the testimonies shared here today, and the reading and teaching of your word, not only would your daughters, our sisters in Christ, be encouraged in their walk with the Lord, strengthened to persist and praise you in whatever season of life they may be facing, but that you would be exalted and lifted up above all. Lord, we want to thank you for your faithfulness towards us, that you will fulfill your promises for each one of us, and that your steadfast love endures forever. Your reign over all things, you're sovereign, and you will keep us. You will hold us fast. Be with us today, I pray, in Jesus' name. you guys were all blessed by those two songs. I've been singing them probably alongside Marie in her house all week, and they have just been such a blessing to me to um, keep my eyes on Jesus. And so um, now Ainsley will be sharing a, her testimony with us. Uh, she is Pastor Tyrell's wife and mother to Sarah and Zachary and little Joseph, and uh, they joined the Pineland family this year all the way from South Africa. And so we welcome you to the front, Ainsley, to share with us your testimony. Thank you. 
What beautiful lyrics. Not I, but through Christ in me. Um, good afternoon, ladies. What a joy it is to be together in these unusual times uh, when we aren't really able to meet much. How wonderful it is also to be able to celebrate new life in the church, um, with two new babies especially. Thank you to all the women who organized this event. I've really enjoyed meeting so many of you um, over the past two months, and yet there are so many that I haven't really spoken to. Tyrell and I are incredibly grateful for how you have helped us move to this part of the world um, and settle at Pineland Baptist Church. Thank you for all the meals, supplies, and advice <laughs> as we adjust. We really do appreciate your kindness. We also really love to have people over for supper in our home, and we are hoping to be able to do that in the not-too-distant future. A few weeks ago when I came into membership here, my testimony was printed out. So what I'm going to say this afternoon, you probably have heard already, but I just thought I should expand on it a little. As you can hear, I have an accent. <laughs> so if there is anything that is unclear, um, feel free to ask me. <laughs> yeah, I try not to speak so quickly. <laughs> Tyrell has told me that I'm already starting to change the way I speak. <laughs> A. So, <laughs> um, I grew up in Johannesburg, South Africa, in a very loving but non-believing home. My father is South African and my mother is an immigrant from Italy. We were raised nominally Catholic, and once my siblings and I had all been confirmed in the Catholic Church, my family stopped practicing Catholicism or any faith. I went to my local primary elementary school where my mom was a teacher. At this school, there were many other students and teachers who attended the local Baptist church, uh, Mondial Baptist. As I look back on those early years, I now realize there was a series of people sharing the gospel with me during that time, though I made no true profession of Christ. Um, I continued to participate in Mondial Baptist's youth group as a teenager while attending a performing arts high school as a ballet dancer. It was a very liberal school and a very secular education. And yet the Lord graciously saved me out of that environment in grade 11 when a friend from youth invited me to attend a Sunday service at Mondial Baptist. I remember going just out of fear of facing hell after I die, but the Lord used those first few weeks to really impress on me my need for a savior um, and that I could have one in the person of Jesus Christ. It became fairly clear to me early on that I needed to repent of my sins and trust in Christ for the forgiveness of them in order to be made right before God. Not everybody needs to remember the specific time of when they were saved, but I am grateful that I remember mine and the significant change that followed. After finishing school, I went to work as a ballet dancer at the South African Ballet Theatre. The Lord continued to work in me during this time and this year bringing me to the youth group, which was led by Tyrell, um, uh, and he, he brought me into a deeper sanctification. Tyrell specifically taught us the doctrines of grace that are laid out in scripture, and about after six months, I could no longer reconcile my career path as a ballet dancer with my faith. We can talk more about that in detail if you want. <laughs> um, I decided to leave the ballet company, and soon after this, Tyrell and I um, began dating, and he finished his theological studies. Now, the following year, I enrolled at university where I majored in journalism, and Tyrell was called to be an associate pastor at a Baptist church one hour north in Pretoria. At the end of my second year, we married, and in my final year of studies, he planted Heritage Baptist Church. Um, the quick story behind Heritage is that Tyrell saw a need for the gospel in the city near the students. Um, and Heritage started out with just 10 people in the corridor of a house, and 10 years later, we had about 180 people attending faithfully, and they owned their own building. The church was, is, was growing strong, and we both worked hard to grow the church from scratch, and the Lord used both good and difficult times to cultivate in us Christ-likeness through those years. 
Um, after graduating, I worked as an ESL teacher for a few years, and in 2015, we became parents to little Sarah. Uh, we had our busy boys, Zachary, in 2017, and Joseph in 2019, and we're truly able to say that children are a blessing from the Lord. The ongoing hard work of parenting and training them in the way of the Lord has returned much fruit in our own personal lives and in our own holiness. We are so grateful for our fun-loving, spirited kids. I'm sure you've seen them running around the church every Sunday. Yep, that's our kids. They're the ones, they're the busy ones, they're the loud ones. We have only just begun homeschooling Sarah a few weeks ago, um, who is in kindergarten this year. And we just trust the Lord in this new, uncharted und undertaking. Please pray for us. <laughs> Over the years, I've been able to witness the ups and downs of church life and ministry alongside my husband. He's not a perfect person, but he is a steady servant of the Bride of Christ. I'm excited to see how God uses him and our family at Pine and Baptist in this new chapter of life. We're very grateful to be here. Um, I love the title theme of today's uh, meeting, Trusting God Through the Seasons of Life. It seems as if all of us have had a major change in season over the last year or so because of COVID. Some of us may have finished school or started new jobs. Some of us have lost loved ones. Some of us may have, fit, um, may have had babies. <laughs> Some of us have had to take care of the sick. Some of us have moved across the world. As I look at my own life, and how much has changed recently, I've been forced to hold dear the things that are universal. The things that don't change when you don't have your daily habits, comforts, friends, and family to cling to. And of course, the one thing that is constant is the Lord and his goodness. He has used the seasonal change to point me to his unchanging truths. His ways are not my ways. His love is sure and continual, his mercies are new every morning, his grace is sufficient for the day, and his gospel is the remedy for all sinners from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Two things that have especially helped me through trying times this year have been, one, a clinging to the cross. We as believers need to be reminded of the cross and Christ's deep love for us daily. We need to confess our sin to him regularly and know the restoration and the peace that Christ has made for us. It brings a very deep well of peace. And two, it's been a constant reading of God's word. The Bible is a deep well of truth in a world that is plagued by sin and suffering. If we prioritize reading or hearing God's word often, even amongst the crazy days of diapers and sleep deprivation, Stephanie, Leah, <laughs> If we prioritize the reading or hearing of God's word often, then we know we will have strength to obey him and get through the work God has given us to do. Not only will we be able to do it, but scripture also says we will be able to accomplish our work with hope. As Romans 15 verse 4 says, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. I'm praying for the women of Pineland that we can get to know one another as fellow disciples of Christ in the months and years to come, and that we will be women who are known by their love of Christ and his word. Thank you. So typically when we um, celebrate the arrival of a new baby here at Pineland, we would have a shower in the fellowship hall with the devotional and games and gifts and always special treats. Um, and while things may look different this year, we couldn't let any more time pass without celebrating new life and God's blessing in the Hewson family's life with Elizabeth Hewson and the Buscarino and Blundell family with Grayson Buscarino. So if I could call up a few people, Ainsley, I'm actually going to call you back up here <laughs> as well. Um, and then Leah Houston, Stephanie Buscarino, Barb Lane, and Carol Dumichel, if you could come up to the front.
Carol. <laughs> oh, there she is, Ronan. And um, at this point, we'll have a moment of prayer for you all. You can stay up here or you can go back down. Um, we've asked Judy Clark to lead us in that because uh, Judy has such a heart for young moms. I know for myself, as she's led the Moms Morning Out Bible study for many years, we got to know each other there. And um, Judy always did a great job in exalting Jesus Christ and reigning us in. Um, she's also a pastor's wife, and along with Pastor Don, she's planted churches as well and been in ministry for many years while raising their family. And so would you lead us, Judy? As I watched Ainsley up here, it brings back memories of three little kids and moving to a brand new church and things that you think are simple, like what grocery store do I go to? Where's the doctor's office? Where do I go to just walk and be alone? Become difficult in many decisions. So I know where she's coming from. We haven't gone across the ocean, but I'm sure that magnifies it even more. So um, let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the blessings of these new little ones. How privileged we are at Pineland to be able to watch them grow and to support these young couples as they uh, raise their families. We thank you for Elizabeth and Grayson and Joseph. And we think of the other children of Peyton and Zachary and Sarah. And uh, Lord, we just pray for these families. It's not easy to raise children in this day, and especially with the pandemic. We just pray that you would give them the patience they need, the grace that they need, and the love that they need. And Father, that as they go about their lives, that each day in the way, as you've said in Scripture, that uh, they would be talking about you, that they would be sharing your love, your faithfulness, your care. And we do pray that each one of these little ones would very early in their lives come to know you as personal Savior and um, give their life to serving you. And Father, we think of the families, uh, help them with balancing work and family that they would always have time for you, Lord, to keep you in the center of their family life as they go on. We pray for Ainsley as she's come to us. What a blessing that is. We thank you for many prayers that have an been answered along the way. And we do pray for her that you would give her new friends, that you would help her with the decisions that need to be made with housing and all those things of schooling and to places where she needs to go to find what she needs. And Father, that you would also um, help her as she supports Terrell, that she would know how much to be involved and how much to just be with her family and have time to herself. So Lord, we thank you for what you're gonna do. We look forward to watching these little ones grow 
into getting to know Terrell and Ainsley better as we go along. So, Father, thank you for this day in Jesus' name. Amen. We also have actually an extra gift that I will hand out to you later. Uh, providentially, Sarah's mother had um, crocheted or knitted some blankets, and there happens to be three of them. So there'll be one for um, Elizabeth and Grayson and for Joseph as well. So thank you so much for that. Um, Our guest speaker today is Marie Joint, and that sounds really weird coming out of my mouth because I don't call her that at home. Um, on the back of your card, there is a short bio on her and how God has led her in a life of uh, ministry in worship and encouragement of women. Um, she teaches now, and she is writing, and she speaks as well. And so um, if you've ever heard Kevin and I share our testimony, you would have heard us share that our neighbors actually witnessed to us over several years, and they shared the gospel with us. And um, they've been such an important part of our lives and our walk with the Lord. And they are the first people we call when we are praising the Lord for something. And they have prayed alongside of us, and we have prayed together um, during those many difficult times. And so... They aren't just our neighbors, they are our family, and we call them that. They are Annie Ree and Uncle Dan. And um, I referred to Marie also as my spiritual mother, but she is my dear sister in Christ, and I know you will be blessed today by her speaking. And so if you could come up, Marie, and share with us today. Thanks, honey. I often refer to <clears throat> Christina I have two daughters, but I refer to Christina as the daughter that has given me the least problems. <laughs> um, they are family to us. And I said to Kevin and Christina, if the Lord would have told me 10 years ago, one, I would be speaking. Two, I would be speaking in a church that Kevin and Christina were so involved in. Me of little faith. I would have said, are you sure? But I am so, so thankful to be here today. I, I cannot tell you how excited I am to be here today. I'm excited as we were watching with the, the rulings of things that um, we were still given that permission to meet and to be together and come together and just to encourage one another in this season. So before we turn to the word of the Lord... Let's turn to the Lord of the Word who is going to direct us and guide us this day. Heavenly Father, um, just so thankful, so thankful to be in the house of the Lord with these ladies today. And I just pray for guidance and help as we study together your Word. Lord, may we Tune in and hear your voice in a world right now that there's so many things to distract us and to listen to. May we know your word today will be spoken here through you, Lord, not through me, but that your word may be spoken and may your word feed the hungry and fill the expectant heart. May this all be today for your glory and for our good. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So the day started as a beautiful, sunny summer day. Our 29-year-old, who was nine years old at the time, Aaron was attending a local church camp. The camp organizers had decided it was the perfect day to canoe across the lake and enjoy a barbecue picnic with all the campers. The day was running along so nicely, and after lunch, all the campers and all the leaders climbed back into their canoes and headed back to camp. They were out in the middle of the lake, halfway home, when a terrible storm blew in out of nowhere. 
it came with gushing rains and wind and severe hail. I remember it particularly well because I was with our other daughter, Amanda, and we were having lunch at a little coffee shop in town. And I remember how we looked out the window and we could see the storm coming in. And we watched it as the pelting rain came down and this hail that was so severe that many insurance claims from local car dealerships were submitted because the, the hail had, was that big. You know, you hear the saying as the size of golf balls, but it was huge and it did such damage to cars. But little, so my mother's heart immediately thought of Aaron. But I never imagined that Aaron was out in the middle of the lake in this. I never imagined it. I knew we would be going back to camp because we had our trailer there and we would be staying there for the week. After the weather had settled, Amanda and I returned to camp. When we arrived, the last canoe had just come in to shore. We were totally unaware of all that had happened. We ran down to the shore. There was a range of emotions. There was happy tears, there were fearful tears, there was hugging, there was shouting, there was thanksgiving, there was praising God. As we were just taking it all in of what had just happened, this little girl, she was about six years old, she came up to me and she said, it was so bad, it was so bad out there. And we were so scared, and we started to pray, and then she paused. And when we started to pray, it got worse. <laughs> How often does that happen in our lives? We take a stand, we pray, we hand it over to God, we put our complete trust in Him, and then when the storm continues to rage, we question. When the storm doesn't pass as quickly as we would have thought, we start to flounder in doubt and fear. We at times even question God and his love for us. We wonder if he cares at all. We question, where are you, Lord? And in the turmoil sometimes, our vision gets really cloudy and all we see is the storm. I find that when my focus is on the storm and when I fix my eyes on the storm, that fear and anxiety swallow me up pretty quickly. At times when this storm, we're focusing on it, we can almost convince ourselves that the storm is bigger than God. And we lose sight of the one who is right with us in the storm. The passage today that we are going to study in God's word is in Mark 4. Now, this is a familiar passage to many of you. This story is um, the story of Jesus in the storm with his disciples. Um, and it is also found in each of the Gospels. Now, often this passage is, is preached, and the reference is, he can calm the storms in your life. And that is truth. He most certainly can. The other times that it's preached and brought forth this passage, sometimes it's a reminder. He has authority over even all the elements. He can say, be still. And the wind listens to him. And that, again, is absolutely truth. But today our focus is going to be, he is with you in the storm. He is with you in the boat when that storm is coming. So if you have your Bibles, or even it's on your um, your card there. I'm just reading um, from the NIV here, and I'm just going to read Mark 4.
That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A ferocious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, he rebu rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So here's a little bit of background when the scripture says that day. So Jesus had just spent the entire day preaching about the kingdom of God. The crowd grew so large that he had decided he was going to climb into the boat and he was going to teach from the lake. He spoke in many parables that day and scriptures explain um, that Jesus did not say anything to the crowd without using a parable. And the best way to ex just explain and refresh ourselves with a parable, a parable is just a, a short story that teaches um, a moral or a spiritual lesson. And Jesus used often these parables, and he used often earthly stories to teach heavenly truths. But it also says in Scripture, but when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. So the disciples had just listened to hours of Jesus teaching the word. And then Jesus took extra time to explain his teachings in detail to them. Now let's return to the boat. There are three truths, if you're taking notes today, there are three truths that this passage that I'd like to focus on regarding storms. So the first one is, sometimes Jesus leads us into the storm. Sometimes Jesus leads us into the storm. In this passage, the first thing Jesus says is, let's go. And is, the disciples go, like immediately. This passage tells us they took him just as he was. There was no hesitation. There was no asking where or how long or why. Jesus said, let's go to the other side, and they left. Do you think Jesus knew the storm was coming? Of course he did. He was taking them into the storm, but he was also with them in the storm. He was taking them over to the other side. They didn't question him. They went. The disciples were walking in obedience. The storm was not coming because of disobedience or sin in the disciples' lives. That wasn't the case with Jonah, as we all know. God said, go to Nineveh, and, and Jonah went the opposite way, and we all know how that ended up. Jonah left the presence of God, and he suffered the consequences of it. But this storm wasn't the case. Here, these men are listening. They're, they're, they're hungry for his teaching. They're listening to his teaching. They were devoted followers of Christ. They were obeying him, and they went into the storm. Now, when I was a new believer, and just not knowing the word, and the truth of the word, I often thought, there was something in me that I thought, you know what? You, you accept Jesus into your heart, everything's going to be perfect. Everything's going to be perfect. I'm going to be walking on sunshine because everything's great. And if I just keep working hard and crossing those T's and dotting those I's and li just living this Christian life right, nothing or no storm would ever come. 
and it'll just be smooth sailing. Well, one, that's not even scripture. It doesn't support it. If anything, what does Jesus say? In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. He says there will be times of trials and there will be times of temptations and there will be times, but I'm with you. But at the time, I would think if a storm came, it was because maybe I was doing something wrong or maybe I just forgot to cross a T or dot an I. That wasn't the case. The storms will come but he is with me in every storm. And he allows storms to come in our lives. It was just like he did all that teaching, and now these disciples were going to be tested, and they would grow in their faith in him. James 1, 2 to 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because... You know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Jesus had taught and explained to detail, and now they were going to be facing a test. The storm was on its way, which takes us to point number two. He is in complete control of the storm. He is in complete control of the storm. I love how scripture explains Jesus in this journey to the other side. Scripture so reminds us how he is fully God and he is fully man in this brief passage. Being fully man, he was tired. He was in need of rest. He was tired from the long day of teaching And being fully God, he rested in peace. The description is so detailed that it just didn't say he was sleeping there. It says he found a pillow, and he went to the back of the boat, and he fell fast asleep. I don't know about you ladies, but sometimes when I'm worrying about something, I get mad at my husband if he can fall asleep. I want him to stay up and worry with me. I want him to stay up and fret, and I will look over at him, and he's sound asleep. Why isn't he worrying with me? Why isn't he, how can he sleep in peace? Probably because he's given it to the Lord, and I'm still struggling with it and holding on and trying, helping the Lord with that situation. When the storm came in, it came out of nowhere, and it was ferocious. Now, we must remember that these men were used to storms. Their lives of being fishermen, they would have encountered many storms. They had navigated through some very rough waters. Yet this storm was different. This was the storm of all storms. Their familiarity with rough water was there, but this could not compare to anything they had ever walked through. It was dark, it was ferocious. They realized that their smooth sailing was over. The waves crashed, the wind hurled, and they were about to drown as the water kept entering into the vessel. And where was Jesus? He was right there with them. But fear was overwhelming them. The storm was not ceasing. They ran to Jesus. They woke him up with this. Teacher, don't you care if we drowned? The most ferocious storm we have ever walked through as a family was March 5th, five years ago. I, um, and I know many of you, if you were here at this church five years ago, you were lifting up our family, you were praying for our family. Our daughter, Amanda, our oldest daughter, Amanda, she's an RN, and she was 27 weeks pregnant um, for our grandson. And um, she 
you know, she hadn't been feeling well, but you kind of chalk everything up to, you know, just morning sickness and, and whatnot. But this one night, how the Lord would have it, they slept at our home. And Amanda would never sleep at our home the night before going to work at the hospital. She just didn't. But this night, they did, her and Reuben. Amanda wakes up a little bit after midnight, and she comes in and to Danny in my room, and she said, Mom, I'm really not feeling well. And she said, I have, she said the clinical term, and I am just waking up, and she said, I have upper something, something, something. And I literally looked at her, but she's saying the clinical thing of it, and, and all I knew is, Danny, get out of bed, go to the basement to sleep, Amanda, come in, and I'll rub your back type thing. But something wasn't right. And my mother's heart knew something wasn't right. Now, I can jump to fear. That, that's my default. I can jump to that and worry very quickly. But it was something that just wasn't right. Amanda laid down with me. Amanda got up to go to the bathroom. And she got sick. And then she came back. And um, we had Kentucky Fried Chicken that night, so she really thought she might have been having like a gallbladder attack. And I said to her, I said, um, get Reuben up, we're going to the hospital. And she got up, and the pain was so bad, and she said, oh, mom, 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 you know. And, uh, she's, and I said, no, we're going, and we're going to McMaster. We're going to... Well, she looked at me like I had two heads. Why are we going to McMaster and, and whatever? I said, no, we're going to go down to McMaster to sick kids because we're just, we're just going. Let's, we're going. Get Reuben and we're going. So from Caledonia to McMaster, it was about 35-minute drive. The pain was getting really bad. Amanda was getting a terrible headache. Um, she just she wasn't herself. She was, she was agitated, really, really agitated for Amanda. And so... Um, we get to the hospital, we walk in, she's in severe pain, and we, we, they send us up to the maternity ward. The maternity ward that night, because I'll never forget it, when we walked in, there were like eight nurses sitting there. There were no babies being born. But God, again, God knew that within five minutes we needed them all. So Mandy gets in there, and they did her blood pressure. And when they did her blood pressure, she was, it, it was skyrocketing to the point that they said, our machine's wrong, we're going to do the blood pressure manually because that can't, that can't be. And uh, it was like 245 over 145. So the one nurse, she spoke what she was thinking. She says, we have to hurry. She's going to stroke on us. We knew we were taken into a storm that was unbelievable at that point. I stood there with my son-in-law. I text Danny and said, get here, get here fast. Um, within the next few minutes, they knew they had to deliver our grandson. He, it would have been 27 weeks. Amanda went into complete organ failure. Um, she... It, it was, it, like I said, it was just, it was something just, I just couldn't, we just couldn't even fathom. It was so quick. It was out of nowhere. And we, in that window, were losing her and we were losing this baby. Amanda went again, internally bleeding. Every organ was shutting down. Um, and they delivered this little 1.7 pound baby. They had to, because how they explained it to us, she will die if we don't get the baby out of there. So Reuben and I were asked to kind of stand. This happened all within 26 minutes from the time of arriving to the hospital to this. Um, we were just told to stand and not move, literally. That's what they said to us. You stand here and don't move. And we did. And um, I remember my son-in-law saying, should I get my mom and dad? And I said, absolutely, because I, the way it looked, we weren't having much hope. So we overheard the nurse say that Amanda was on a ventilator. And that was the part where I said to the Lord, 
that was kind of it for me. I, ventilator to me meant we weren't coming out of this one. And I text, or I phoned Danny, and I said, where are you? I think God is taking our girl. And before Amanda went in for the surgery, she looked to me and she said, Mom, you know, as if to help it. And I remember saying to her distinctly, this is all in God's hands. I didn't that night question why God or why us or anything, but I could not comprehend how we were going to get out of this storm. I just couldn't. The days that followed, Amanda's kidney shut down. Um, I think the worst sentence I think I ever heard someone say was when I said to a nurse, because Amanda and Matthew, Matthew is our grandson, which means gift of the Lord, and he owns his name. Um, but I said to a nurse in the NICU, I said, I just feel if they could see each other, like, you know, they're both so critical. And she said to me, she said, I promise you, if we get to the point and we know we're going to lose one of them, I will make sure they see each other. So all my mother's fears were being affirmed that we had little to no hope for either of them making it. How God would have it is that, I remember our pastor came, he was on missions in Haiti, and he came directly to us. And when he arrived, and he was praying, and I said to the Lord, he, like, he was crying with us at the bed, and I said to him, I said, Pastor, we need so many miracles. I just don't know how. I know he can, but I don't know how. Well, I'll tell you, in the next hundred days, we went from being told the kidney, she's going to need a kidney, to being told at the dialysis clinic that they said to us, honestly, <laughs> Will you tell all these people that are praying to stop? Because her kidneys are really working now, and they're working overtime and draining out the good stuff. <laughs> so it was just like we, we went from a, a NICU baby that even our Christian friend who worked in the NICU said he should have had a brain bleed. They all have brain bleeds. He didn't. We went and we saw the Lord move in ways in our storm that we could not even fathom. I think the worst thing that debilitated me is when I started to focus on the storm, started to focus on the statistics, started to focus on even just what we were being told, that would bring such crippling fear. But when we took our focus off, like Jehoshaphat did, and he said, if they're coming in from everywhere, I don't know what to do, but... Our eyes are fixed on you. And when we did that, he carried us through. And I can say today, I have a daughter who's fully recovered, and I have a five-year-old grandson that I think is the smartest little boy ever that walked in the earth. <laughs> Let's get back into the boat. Jesus got up. And he didn't reply to their question. Remember what they said? Teacher, don't you care if we drowned? He got up, and Scripture tells us he rebuked the wind. Then he spoke to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. And then he addresses the disciples. And he didn't respond to them in the way he asked them two questions in his response and that leads me to my third point he uses the storms to refine our hearts he uses the storms to refine our hearts the first question that jesus asked them that day was why are you so afraid do I think Jesus was angry or mad at the disciples for being afraid? No, I don't. Notice he rebuked the wind. He did not rebuke them. Remember, Jesus is the one who sympathizes with us. He knows us. His desire that day 
was he wanted to expose the root, and the root was fear. And a lot of our fear is rooted deeply in unbelief. He realized when the storm was raging, these followers had lost their focus. They were overwhelmed, and they focused on the storm and were crippled with fear. The next question Jesus addressed was their faith. He said to them, do you still have no faith? His concern was their little faith. Again, at this point, Jesus knew his time on earth was coming to an end. He wanted them to get it. He knew if their faith wasn't steering the vessel, that their fear and their emotions would be, and that would lead to destruction. Lack of faith says, God, don't you care? God, why have you left me? Lack of faith often questions God, or even in this case, accuses him. It is a tossing, turning, roller coaster kind of faith where you wrestle and struggle and are often full of anxiety and fear. James 1, 5 to 8 reminds us again, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you, but... When you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Ladies, the enemy would desire nothing more than for you to fix your eyes on your storms. And take your eyes off of the one who is with you in the storm. What Jesus wanted for them and what he desires for us here today is a growing faith in him. Where our focus is on him and our faith is in him. A persevering faith that refuses to look and fix our eyes on the circumstances. He desires that faith in each one of us here today. And he honors that faith. James 1.12 reminds us, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. The disciples had seen Jesus perform many miracles and journeyed many days with him. And yet, Scripture says after the storm had calmed, they were terrified. The other Gospels say the men were marveled. Some said they were filled with great awe. They were afraid and amazed. Why do you suppose they were terrified? in awe after that storm. I believe these men were crippled with fear because of their circumstance. And I believe when they addressed him, they addressed him as teacher. But I now believe as they stood in awe, they saw him as Lord. He was Lord over all. The other thing in closing I couldn't help but notice where scripture says there were other boats out on the water that day. When I read that, I, I, and I've read that passage many times, and it really hit me as odd. The disciples were in the boat with Jesus. There were other boats out on the water that day. Those other boats would have went through that same storm. But the sad thing was, those other boats didn't have Jesus in the boat with them. If you've come to a saving faith in Christ, you have the best seed in the boat. 
He's right there with you. But my prayer is that if there's someone here today who does not have him as Savior and Lord, and you're in another boat, that your heart would soften and your hunger would increase. And as God's word says, today if you hear the word of the Lord, do not harden your heart. I pray that you would receive him as Lord and Savior. There's one thing I can tell you. I cannot imagine that storm five years ago, any storm that will come without having him with me. There would be hopelessness. There would be such defeat. But I am thankful today that I could say, and many of you could say, that we are in the boat with him, and he is present with us. He is the one who promises us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Deuteronomy 31.8 reminds us the Lord himself goes before you and he is with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. It says do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. He is not leaving you. And he is with you. Amy Carmichael has a quote that says, Thou art the Lord who slept upon the pillow. Thou art the Lord who soothed the ferocious sea. What matter beating wind and tossing billow if only we are in the boat with thee. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you just for the reminder of your word this day. The reminder to each of our hearts that you are with us. And Lord, we we ask you forgive us because we know that we are those faithless ones sometimes that we focus on the storm and we all we see is the storm and we forget that you are with us journeying through that storm and your promise to us today is that you will never ever leave a child of god lord we thank you for your presence with us we thank you lord because we know that you are meeting with each heart here today and lord above all else we see faces but you see hearts and you know what every individual is struggling with, pushing through, just being maybe defeated and feeling hopeless in this times. It could be the pandemic. It could be health situations. It could be relation situations. But Lord, we also know that you are above all and you are in all and you are with your children. We thank you for this day that we could turn to your word, that we could focus and Lord, may we be reminded this day and for days to come that you are with us as your children you guide us you direct us and everything lord is purpose for your glory and for our good again lord we thank you and praise you and we just thank you again for this time we've had together in jesus precious name amen Thank you so much, Marie, for that um, wonderful message today that we can trust in Jesus and he's with us in those storms. And so we will have one more song in worship uh, so you can stand for that and then we'll have a closing prayer and um, one more special treat before we leave. Um, So please stand in. So before we leave here today, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today that was shared here today with us. 
I pray that it was glorifying to you and that we would be encouraged to trust in the Lord despite our circumstances. That whatever season we are in, you are leading us and you are completely in control. That by these trials and these sufferings, these times of joy, whatever these seasons, you will refine our hearts and we will be drawn closer to you. That we can cast all of our anxieties on you because you care for us. Help us to walk in obedience, Lord, by your spirit. To walk in him, rooted and built up in him, abounding in thanksgiving. To turn our eyes upon Jesus because he is Lord over all. And in his name we pray. Amen. And so now I will call up Nancy. And so take your cards out. So um, first I'm going to announce that the table at the back, like the mid-back part, there's cupcakes and cookies. So they're all prepackaged. Feel free to take one of those. And I'm going to hand out this lovely door prize gift bag. So, I'm going to mix it up, shake it, and let's see what we draw. Number 34. Anyone? Because I know not all of them are picked, so I might have to do some more. So no one has 34. Okay, let's try again. Number six, Judy Clark, yay! So that's the end of our program. Thank you all for coming, and I hope you enjoyed Marie as much as I did. She was truly a blessing.